Hi, Hi guys. guys. My name is Debbie. And I'm Paul, pastor of the Haven Church in New Jersey. We're so glad you're here. At the Haven, we believe that we exist to create a safe haven for people to experience Jesus. Now our team has put together these videos, the planning, the production, for one purpose, to meet you where you are, to help you on your spiritual journey, to bring encouragement and strength, and, and maybe just inspire you to keep your eyes on the Lord as you walk through the challenges of your life. Now, these are meant to be supplemental to your personal relationship with God day by day, but of course it's very important that you join a church, a local church, according to scripture. If you live in the New Jersey area and would like to be part of the Haven Church, be sure to check the links below so that we can connect with you. And don't forget to like and subscribe to our channel and click the bell icon so that you never miss a weekly video of worship and encouragement. Once again, we are so glad you're here. Enjoy. Enjoy. Haven Church, how are you guys doing today? Troy Welty here coming to you from Charlotte, North Carolina. I am so honored, so blessed to be here, and I hope each and every one of you is having a fantastic weekend. I don't know what that weekend entails for each of you. That could be you're going to kids' ball games. It could be you're cleaning the house, which doesn't sound too much fun. Uh, it could be you're watching some football. Yes, yes, Lord. Could mean you're eating some great food. Thank you, Jesus, for bread and carbs. Uh, it could mean you're doing something crazy. Um, it could mean you're doing something crazy like going on a hike or exercising or something weird like that. Um, hiking people, I love you. I just don't understand you. That's all. It's me. It's not, it's not you. I would just not hike unless I was being chased, I don't think. Because uh, it's crazy to hike up a mountain for fun. But anyway, you know, God be the glory. That's you guys. But seriously, I am I am so excited to be here. I'm thankful to be here. I'm thankful to be sharing a little bit of what God has been working on in me. Um, I'm, I'm thankful to be adding to this series where we're hitting the reset button on our lives, where we're walking into, we're walking out of the summer. And we're walking out of vacation and we're, we're school is back and we're starting back to day to day life. And now we're in this series where we're focusing on some of the fundamentals of our walk, of our faith. Um, and so we're hitting the reset button on a lot of things. And I'm excited on one of the greatest human reset buttons that I believe is in the Bible. And that is the story of Peter and the story of Peter's restoration. But before I get too much farther, let me give you a little bit about me in case you don't you don't know who I am and you're like who is this guy and why are we listening to him um, so about me again my name is Troy I'm from the south um, I don't have that thick of a country accent you may be thinking otherwise uh, my dad's from Pennsylvania and my mom is from Puerto Rico so I didn't really have much of a shot to get to have a southern accent I married a woman uh, for eight years her name is Megan she's way out of my league um, guys, I highly encourage marrying someone way out of your league. It's awesome. Uh, it's great. And if you're like, oh, he's just joking. It's like, no, there's, I mean, we, we're out in public and, you know, people are looking at us and be like, oh, that guy must have a lot of money to be able to land a woman like her. And it's just like, no, I don't, which is great. It's just great. God's favor is all over that. Um, we have a six year old daughter. She's in first grade. She's learning how to read more and more things. And parents, I don't know if you're anything like me, but I'm finding that oftentimes now I'm sitting there trying to explain things to my six-year-old that I actually don't really understand. Uh, the other day she was asking me how uh, a satellite worked. And I was just like, oh, it's just this, it's like this metal dish uh, that's in space. And she was like, well, what does it do? I was like, oh, I think it shoots signals or lasers. And she's like, how does it make a signal? And I was just like, I mean, this is enough. Enough is enough. I don't know. Um, so I don't know if you're like that, but that's what I've been experiencing with my daughter. Um, and then I have a one-year-old son. He's walking. He's he's just a big bundle of joy. He's getting faster and faster. And every time it's quiet in our house, we're like, oh, is, 
What is he into? Um, so that's kind of our life. Uh, as you can see by the jerseys, love sports. Uh, I love Jesus Christ. I love the church. I love Haven. I love what we get to do. I'm so thankful to be with you guys again and my home away from home. And like I said, we're in the sermon series where we're hitting the reset button on some of the fundamentals of our Christian life, of our walk. Um, and so today I want to talk to you about Peter. And today, when I was diving into God's word, I don't know if you're like me, but the, but the main topic that I was feeling in my heart, that I was feeling in my spirit, the main thing that I was wrestling through, and I wrestle through at different times of my life, is, is one simple question, is did God make a mistake? And if you're honest like me, it is hard to walk through this life without feeling that question come to reality of, did God make a mistake? Sometimes it's hard not to look at the news or sometimes it's hard to look at the midst of this pandemic, of this COVID pandemic, and not to ask God of, did he make a mistake by doing this? Now, to be honest with you, and I'll be vulnerable and transparent, a lot of times when I ask myself that question of, did God make them make a mistake? It is about me. Did God make a mistake by making me this way? Did God make a mistake by by telling me this in my heart? Did God make a mistake by putting me in this position that I'm not qualified for? Did God make a mistake by not giving me the right strengths or the right gifts to do what I want to do? Did God make a mistake by entrusting me with these resources or these finances, knowing that I can't steward them as well as maybe other people can? Did God make a mistake with me? Oftentimes, I sit there and ask myself that question um, and will ponder that more and more and more of, did God make a mistake with me? But you can ask that yourself that question around anything. And so we're going to dive into the life of Peter and some of the things that he was going through, because I think that question was running through Peter's mind, and it ends with a beautiful restoration of Peter's call to ministry, to Peter's life, and to who Jesus Christ is in his life. And so I want to take us through through that. Before I do, let me just pray over us and pray over the next 15 to 20 minutes as, as we move forward. Heavenly Father, first I glorify you. I thank you for who you are. God, I am thankful that you restore all things. I am thankful that you are the the healer, that you are the ultimate provider, that you are a great physician, um, that you are our King of Kings and Lord of Lords. God, I just ask that you remove any and all distractions from all of our hearts and minds, because all of us are walking in with some thoughts, whether we're thinking about what's what are we doing tomorrow or what's after this, or I can't believe this happened at work this week, or my kids are acting up. God, I just ask that you remove all of that. And that you let your spirit move and transform our hearts and transform our days and transform our moments and our minutes as we just set our eyes and we fix our eyes upon you. God, I ask that no matter where people are, that they feel your presence. Whether they're alone, whether that we're, they're in a group of people, I ask that your spirit just overflow the physical space that everybody is currently in. And that we can hear from you, that we can see you that we can feel you just guiding us and moving us to who you've called us to be. God, I ask that the next 15 minutes be edifying and glorifying to you. Um, and thank you for your son and everything that he did on the cross as he restored all things and restored all things to your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so guys, a little bit before I get into the scripture, we're going to be starting uh, in John 21. But before I get into that scripture, there's a couple pieces of information that I need you to know for the scripture to really hit home and to make sense. I wanted this time to be, I had in my original notes, just like 
15 different scriptures on Peter. Um, and I'm not going to do that today because I want to be honoring of all of our time, but there's some pieces of information that you need to know. Uh, and then I'm going to, I'm going to hopefully set up our time, but there is going to, there's going to be our main scripture is going to be in John and then, but our introductory scripture is going to be in Luke chapter five. Okay. So this, uh, this piece of scripture is when Jesus called Simon, who is now called Peter, as we know him, to be one of his disciples, to follow him, to be one of his crew, one of his squad. I don't know if that's popular anymore, that squad, uh, but one of his squad. Um, So we're going to start in Luke chapter 5, and we're going to see what God has to tell us in the midst of all of this. So it says, while Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, which is basically essentially the Sea of Galilee, okay, many people pushed to get near Jesus. They wanted to hear the word of God. Jesus saw two boats on shore. The fishermen were not there because they were washing their nets. Jesus got into a boat which belonged to Simon. Simon, who's Peter. Jesus asked him to push it out a little way away from the land. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, push out into the deep water. Let down your nets for some fish. Simon, Peter who was a fisherman, said to him, Teacher, we have worked all night and we have caught nothing. Now, but because you told me to, I will let the net down. When they had done this, they caught so many fish, their net started to break. They called to their friends working in the other boat to come and to help them. They came and both boats were so full of fish, they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he got down at the feet of Jesus and he said, go away from me, Lord, because I am a sinful man. Now let's pause here for a second. So Simon's first realization of who Jesus Christ was as the Messiah, as the Savior, as the Lord of Lord and King of Kings, his first thought process was to dive down at the feet of Jesus in complete surrender and say, go away from me because I am a sinful man. And I wonder, Peter's first response to the realization of Jesus Christ was stating his sins, his depravity, and his worth in the presence of God. I wonder if if all of us don't feel that way in some sense of, of Jesus Christ, you are so good, you are so amazing that I am, you need to get away from me because I am a sinful person, because I don't deserve to be in your presence, and you shouldn't even look at me because of my depravity. And then in verse 9, it says, He and all those with him were surprised and wondered about the many fish. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, were also surprised. They were working together with Simon. Then Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on, you will fish for men. And then when they came to land with their boats, they left everything and followed Jesus. So essentially what happens is, is that Peter and his, his friends and, and some of his crew um, are, are fishing all night. This is what they do. They're fishermen. This is their experts. They're professionals. They're fishing all night. They catch nothing. Jesus is teaching by the water, by the Sea of Galilee, which is really important to remember. And all of a sudden... Jesus asked to use his boat. Then he says, hey, push this boat out a little bit more and let's throw your nets on the other side. And and Simon is like, listen, we've been fishing all night. We haven't caught anything. But if you tell us to do it, I'll do it. I'll, you know, we'll, we'll do it. We'll figure it out. So he does it. And there's an abundance of provision. There's an abundance of blessing. And in response to this, Peter falls down on his feet at the feet of Jesus and says, I go away from me, Lord, because I am a sinful man. And then Jesus says to him, don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for men. And and one of the things, this is probably point 1A in this sermon series, or in this sermon, excuse me, is that sometimes, I don't know if you're, if you're like this, but there are some times where I feel so depraved and so sinful and so unworthy and so unvaluable and such a horrible, horrible person that I am afraid to approach Jesus Christ, that I am afraid to be in the presence of God because of who I am and what I have done. And I think it's interesting that Peter's first response to Jesus was that of go away from me. I'm not worthy of this. And Jesus's first thing was don't be afraid. 
I have a great calling upon your life. And I believe he's saying the same thing to us. He's saying to you, he's saying that you may be afraid of the calling that I have placed on your life. You may be afraid because you don't feel like you're, you're able enough because you don't feel like you're holy enough to, you don't feel like you're qualified for enough, but I have a, I have a calling for your life and that do not be afraid because for now you will fish for men. You were fishing for fish. And now I've got this huge calling upon your life. Leave everything and follow me. And that's what they did. They left everything and follow Jesus. Okay, so let me, let me speed up a little bit. So this is how Peter, Simon, Peter is called to a disciple of Jesus Christ. This is exactly how he's called to, uh, to follow Jesus Christ. And he does that for three years. And throughout that time, in different pieces of scripture that we won't read, but in different pieces of scripture, we identify that Peter is a huge, huge player and a huge, huge part of God's ministry and calling when he gets crucified and, and rises to heaven and the disciples are there to build the church. And then towards the end of Jesus's life, as you know, he's getting prepared to be crucified. He tells his disciples at the last supper that one of you is going to betray me. And then he also says that Peter will deny him, deny Jesus Christ three times. And Peter is offended. He's like, no, 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 that is not me. That's not who I am because I love you so much, Jesus, that I would never do that. Everybody else on this world may do that, but I'm not going to do that. That's not me. I would never deny you. And lo and behold, we find out in Luke chapter 22 in verses 54 through 62 that exactly as Jesus predicted, Peter denied Christ three different times. And I'm not going to read the whole scope of it, of that piece of scripture, but I am going to read uh, the last couple of verses of that where it says, 61, after Peter had denied Jesus three times, it says in verse 61, and the Lord, the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And Peter remembered the saying of the Lord, how he had said to him, before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And then Peter, he went out, and he wept bitterly. So I want us to stop right here for a second because can you imagine the feeling that Peter might be feeling right now? Can you imagine the amount of shame, the amount of guilt, the amount of fear, the amount of unworth that he might be thinking in this moment? Because if I look at the story of Peter up until that point, he was a fisherman who wasn't he wasn't a religious elite. He wasn't a, a, uh, a pastor. He wasn't a synagogue leader. He wasn't an elder. He wasn't a deacon. He was a fisherman. And he saw some amazing miracle of God. God called him and told him that you're going to fish for men, that you're going to be the, the foundation that my church is built upon, that you're going to do amazing things. And he saw miracles and he saw all of these awesome things. And then in the worst moment of, of his life, when he's been walking with Christ for three years, Jesus tells him that you're going to deny me three times. And then Peter's like, no, 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 I would never do that. I would never do that. I love you too much. I would never do that. And then while Jesus is being tortured, while he's on trial, while he's in trouble, and now Peter is fearing for his life, he's fearing for his safety, he's wondering what in the world is going on, that he didn't think that this would end this way. And so in that moment of weakness, he was approached three different times by three different people, and he denied Christ three different times. And after he had realized what he had done, I bet you as he was weeping, he was probably thinking of how, how unworthy I am, how, how of a horrible human being I am, how sinful I am, how depraved I am, how God must have made a mistake because there's no way that he should have picked me, Peter, who just denied Christ three times publicly. There's no way he should have picked me to start to build his church. There's no way God must have made a mistake. I'm just a fisherman. I'm just a lowly fisherman who isn't qualified, who isn't equipped 
who, who isn't holy enough, who isn't righteous enough, who isn't smart enough to figure all of this stuff out. And so in one way, he's sitting between this promise and he's sitting in between his sin and his depravity and his what he sees as his value and his perspective. And he's seeing this promise and this purpose of fulfilling what God has asked him to do. And he's living in the tension of his reality that he's a sinful man. And so he's, he could be thinking God must have made a mistake. And so then we get now, now we're at the meat of our scripture for today. Okay. You're like, dear gosh, this guy hasn't even been to the meat yet. Good gosh. Um, so in John chapter 21, I want to look at a piece of scripture because this is, this is about Peter's restoration. And I believe that, that God is, is speaking to me, speaking through me, that he wants to restore some things in your life. I believe with all of my heart that God wants to restore some things in you and through you, in your life, in your community, in this church. God wants to restore something. And so we're going to look at Peter's restoration because in in a couple of moments and 24 hours, he was at his highest of highs sitting with Jesus Christ, the, the creator of the universe at a, at a dinner table. And then in a couple hours, Jesus Christ is being tortured. His life is being threatened. And he realized that maybe he didn't have the spine to stick up for Jesus the way he thought that he would. And so in John, John chapter 21, we're going to start in verse one, and I'm going to hopefully read quickly. Okay. But then we're going to get through this. So it says, after Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the sea of Galilee. Okay. So pause. Jesus appeared to his disciples a couple times before this. He's going to appear to his disciples again. But this is by the Sea of Galilee. Remember the Sea of Galilee? This is where Peter was first called to be a disciple. Okay? So it happened this way, starting in verse 2. Simon Peter, Thomas, and a couple others were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. And they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat. But that night they caught anything. Is this, they, they didn't catch anything. Is this sounding familiar? So in verse four, it says early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples didn't realize that it was Jesus. Now I was, I always wondered about this. Like, how did you not realize this was Jesus? A couple of people thought, think different things. One is that since it was early in the morning, there could have been this great fog amongst the sea of Galilee. So it maybe have not, what maybe wasn't super clear as to who was over there. And so Jesus, he, he called out to them in verse five and it says, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. I mean, this is like a carbon copy of exactly how, how Peter was first called on the exact same sea in the exact same scenario of when Jesus was first called to where he is now questioning his calling. Then in verse seven, it says, then the disciple who Jesus loved said to Peter, it is Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord. He wrapped his outer garment around him for he had taken it off and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153. But even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread and gave it to him and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. So guys, I don't think it's any, any coincidence that at Peter's moment of him doubting his calling that he, Jesus reinvents the exact same scenario of Peter's first calling to the ministry, to calling to follow Jesus. And so this is the next part where Jesus and Peter have a conversation. Um, it starts in verse 15. It says, when they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Essentially more than these other disciples. Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. 
Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord. You know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. And then the third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Now pause for a second. I think it's amazing and I think it's it's so, so cool how in this very moment that that the restoration of Peter is very, it's almost the 180 flip from the denial of Peter where people are coming up to him being like, isn't that that Jesus guy that you hang out with? Isn't that that Jesus guy that you know? This is a part of his crew. This guy, Peter, is a part of his crew. And he says, no, 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 I don't know that guy. I don't know him. He did it three times. One of the greatest mistakes of Peter's life was when he denied Christ three different times. And here Jesus is after his ascension, after he rose from the dead, after he defeated death and he defeated hell. He's coming. He's on the third time that he's approached the disciples. He asked Peter and he says, do you love me? Do you love me? And he says, yes, you know, you know all things. You know that I love you. And then Jesus said, feed my sheep. And then in verse 18, it says, very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and, where, and went wherever you wanted. But when you're older, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then said to him, follow me. Just like in the very first calling of Peter, he said, follow me. No matter what you've done, no matter what you think that you've done, no matter how sinful you feel like you are, no matter how depraved you are, no matter the biggest mistake that you've recently made in your life, no matter the story that you keep telling yourself, Jesus is telling you, he's telling me, he says, no matter what you have done, I can restore your mistake and I can make it in a miracle and I need you to follow me. Follow me. I'm getting close to my wrapping in. I've got three things that I wanted to communicate to you guys today as we read in this piece of scripture. Again, like I said, Peter's restoration is so beautiful because it tells the story of even someone who has been following Jesus Christ for three years, who has seen miracles, who has seen people be raised from the dead, who has who has um, seen people be healed, who has seen fish and loaves be multiplied, who has seen people walk, got Jesus walk on water, who's seen incredible things. And you would think, That's someone who has seen those things. They would never doubt Jesus. They would never deny Jesus. They would never make that type of mistake because they know that this is the Lord of Lords and they know that this is the Messiah. But sin can overcome us all in weakness and in fear and in doubt. It can take hold of us. And Peter made a mistake. And the beauty about all of this is that Peter is not void. The people that we look at in the scripture of being these amazing men and women of Christ, and they were, they were not completely sinless. They needed Jesus Christ to restore them. They needed Jesus Christ to die on the cross for their sins. They needed Jesus Christ to make all things new in their hearts and in their lives. They needed Jesus to turn their mistake into a miracle. And I'm sitting here today telling you based off of the scripture that God does not make mistakes. God does not make mistakes. I I need you to hear that and I need you to feel it in your heart is that if you're believing that God made a mistake by calling you, by equipping you, by putting you in this position, by giving you any amount of resources, honestly, sometimes I'm sitting there and being like, did God give me a mistake? Did God make a mistake by making me a father? Did God make me a, 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 did God make mistakes by making me a husband? But God didn't make a mistake. God didn't make a mistake because he knows that I won't be fully equipped to do those things. I'm not fully equipped to be the best husband, to be, to be a complete perfect husband. I'm not fully equipped to be the best person in my job, in my role. I'm not the, I'm not the sinless person who I just get to sit back and say that I've got everything figured out. And I know the reasons why for everything, because I don't. And because of that, I have to lean more on him. God doesn't make mistakes. He didn't make a mistake with you. He didn't make a mistake the way he made you, the way he made you physically, the way he made you spiritually, the way he made you mentally. He did not make a mistake. He didn't make a mistake by putting you in the job that you're in. He didn't make a mistake by putting you in the relationships that you're in. Now we make mistakes all the time. 
I make mistakes all the time, but God didn't make a mistake. And we have the free will to choose different things in our lives. And so if you feel like God has given you a promise, he did not make a mistake with that promise. If you feel like if you're sitting there doubting that God made a mistake by making you who you are, he did not. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. He is going to call you and he's going to equip you. And that doesn't mean that you're going to be perfect. And so we should never be afraid to approach the father because he says, do not be afraid. Follow me. And so God doesn't make mistakes. You have to believe that in your heart, that God doesn't make mistakes. Now, I could get into a whole nother thing, and I won't do it today, but I could do a whole nother sermon on where sin enters and when our choice enters and, and how that moves and maneuvers things. But God knew that Peter would deny him three times at the time of his trial, at the time of his crucifixion. He knew it, and he still called him, and he still equipped him, and he still restored him anyway. Point number two is God can restore all things. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what you feel like is dead. I don't know what you feel like is at the altar of your life. I don't know what you feel like is is too bad or it's too depraved or it's too sinful for God to use anything for it. But I'm telling you right now that God can restore all all things, all people. If you've never come to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior because you feel like you're not worthy of it, good thing is, is that none of us are. I'm not worthy of it. God can restore my sin. He can restore my mistake and turn it into a miracle if we just allow him to move into our hearts and to surrender everything to him, to give him control, to give him everything that we have for him to use what only he can do by his power and his provision, by turning our mistakes into miracle. God is waiting for you to hand that over to him and to obey him for him to do that in your life. God can restore all things. God can restore all things and all people. He can restore you. He can restore your heart. He can restore your perspective. He can restore your finances. He can restore your relationship. He can restore your marriage. He can restore your kids. He can restore your grandkids. He can restore generations from now. He can restore communities. God can restore all things if we follow him. And that's point number three, follow him. Follow him. Following him does not mean that you're going to be perfect. Following him doesn't mean that you're going to be uh, absent of fear, absence of doubt, that you're going to be 100% courageous 100% of the time, that you're going to be the perfect little Christian who's going to highlight everything in their Bible, who's going to pray for 18 hours a day, and who's never going to touch anything uh, made by meat or something uh, crazy like that. It doesn't mean that. Following him means truly following him to try and get as close as you possibly can to who he is so that he can transform you, that he can restore you, that he can work inside of you and work outside of you, and that God can restore anything anything within your life, but it requires us to make a step to follow him. That means that we have to sacrifice. That means we have to surrender. That means we have to leave things. That means we have to work on ourselves. That Just because God can restore all things does not mean that we can continue on sinning. Just because he can make all things new in our lives does not mean that we get to have an opportunity to be some type of way and then just raise our hand and say, I'm sorry, God, can you please forgive me? Can you please restore that? We have to follow him. We have to follow him because if we love him, we're going to want to be more like him. And if we love who Jesus Christ is, we're going to follow him. It's not going to be easy. Don't get me wrong. Having a calling can oftentimes not be comfortable. And I am, I am at victim so many times of worrying too much about my comfort. Ooh, we're getting close. We need to get to the end. I want to tell you today that God doesn't make a mistake. He didn't make a mistake with you. He didn't make a mistake with your situation. We may have, but he didn't. And so God doesn't make mistakes. He made you and he's calling you and he's equipping you. He can restore all things if we just follow him. Pray with me as we, as we close Jesus Christ. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for restoring things and making all things new. God, that we ask that you work inside of our hearts. We ask that you work inside of who we are and who you've called us to be and restore us. Restore our relationships, restore our perspectives, restore our finances, restore our schools, restore the younger generation, restore this church, restore our hearts, restore our minds, make all things new, restore it because you don't make mistakes. Thank you that we can walk away with that confidence and we can live in that courage with that boldness that you don't make mistakes. 
God, I ask that you, you increase your presence and decrease ours. Because that's where the mistakes come in. God, I ask that everybody under the sound of my voice, especially those who maybe have never had a relationship with Jesus Christ, that they come to know who you are right now. That you don't have to be perfect to come to approach the Father, to be called, to be equipped. That you can be who you are right now as you meet us where we are. God, restore our hearts. Restore this country. And restore, uh, restore our lives. We love you, Jesus. Amen. Haven Church, thank you so much for uh, spending some time with me today. I'm praying for you. I'm honored to be a part of this family. Go out, go into the community uh, and preach God's word, preach the gospel, tell people this good news as it's more important than ever. Be blessed. We are so glad you chose to spend time with the Haven Church. We would love to stay in touch with you throughout this week. You can visit our website, social media, or YouTube channel. We do our best to post every week so you can be encouraged and see what you missed and stay in the loop. We pray you are able to experience Jesus and feel his love from wherever you are watching. We'll see you soon. And remember, you belong.